My name is Sister Maria Veritas Marx, and I am doubly a Dominican because I am a very grateful DA alum and also a Dominican Sister of Mary, Mother of the Eucharist. And I'm so grateful to be able to talk to you today about St. Dominic, my father, my uh, father in, in the order. So every founder of a religious order is given a particular grace for the sake of the church. It's called a charism. And every person who enters that order receives a participation in that grace, in that founding grace. And so when I was called to become a Dominican, I received some measure of that grace that St. Dominic had. And I also first experienced that grace as it was lived out and passed on at DA, so which is an apostolate of the Dominican Sisters of Peace. And so I'd like to give you a little biographical sketch of St. Dominic and then share with you three of my favorite stories from his life. So I'm, there are many favorite stories, but just three that illustrate some of his characteristics of personality. So I'd like to talk to you about how St. Dominic was a man of friendship, a man of joy, a man of conversion, and a man of faith. Uh, so St. Dominic, he was born in Spain in Calaruega in 1170 and died in 1221. So just 51 short years, and in that time he did so much. He went away to university, and the first big moment of his life that we know about was when there was a famine in the in the area. He sold his books, the parchments that he used to study from, in order to feed people. And he said, how can I study on dead skins, you know, the parchment papers, when people, living people, are starving? And you might think, wow, that was, you know, a really generous, charitable gesture. And you would be right. But actually, I don't think we can understand easily how radical that was. If you got rid of your books, you weren't studying anymore. That was his, the end of his, his career in, in um, being educated. He basically was a college dropout, I guess you could say, um, because you, those, those parchments were so expensive and they were unique. They were hand copied. You didn't get those back again. And so he sort of began a life of charity instead, um, helping the people around him. And this act, the fame of it spread. People were talking about this amazing thing that Dominic had done. And a nearby bishop was recruiting young men to become priests in his diocese. He wanted to renew his diocese and have his priests live a common life with prayer uh, together. It was called the canons to live as canons. And so he came and he recruited Dominic. He said, this is a man I want. And so Dominic became a, a canon in that diocese of Osma. And he quickly won the esteem of his fellow canons and the esteem of his bishop, who took him on a diplomatic mission to the northern countries. And there was another pivotal moment for St. Dominic. So on his way through France, so he left his native Spain, and on his way through France, he encountered the Albigensian heresy, which was a heresy that said that all things that are material, things that we can see, things that we can touch, those are all evil. And they were created by an evil God. And then there's a good God who created all spiritual things, things that we can't see or taste or touch. And St. Dominic saw when he saw this heresy, he saw how it destroyed people's lives, how it robbed them of happiness how it destroyed families. And he conceived in his heart a great desire to preach the truth to people, to give them back the, the happiness of the truth. And with that desire, also this new idea to have a, an itinerant band of preachers who were well-trained, who would live a combination of the contemplative life of prayer that he had experienced as a canon and the apostolic life of preaching. Now, this was revolutionary, right? Because at the time, people's experience of religious life was basically the, the Benedictine way of life where you have stability. You live in one place for your entire life. And yes, there's preaching, uh, but it's mainly the, the contemplative life and then the work that's associated with that on the land. And so to have a band of preachers that was 
unlimited by boundaries that would go anywhere that would beg for their daily bread. So that's why they were called mendicants, mendicant friars. This was unheard of. Uh, but St. Dominic, he was very familiar with the ecclesiastical structure from his friendship with his bishop in Osma and then later with um, friendship of, with the bishop of Toulouse. And so he went straight to Rome and he talked about his idea. And in 1216, he received permission for this unusual idea that really was a godsend to the church. Um, and in five short years, right, he only had five years from the time that he received permission to do this and the time that he died, he went from just a handful of, of men following him to hundreds of friars, from just a couple of houses in France to dozens of houses. He was very charismatic and people were drawn to him and, and they were drawn to this idea. Um, and he also left us, so we we just celebrated 800 years um, 1216 to 2016, he also left us a great governance structure that has held us in good stead for those eight centuries. So to share some stories from his life that I really love that illustrate his being a man of friendship, of joy, of conversion, and of faith, uh, he was a good friend. He was a master at friendship. He had friends in all walks of life, from wherever he went, one of his best friends that you'll hear about a lot if you ever read a biography of St. Dominic was Cardinal Ugolino, who later became Pope Gregory IX. And um, Cardinal Ugolino, later the Pope, really pushed the friars after Dominic died to start the process of canonization. He said, you really need to, to get on this. Uh, and during the, the, those proceedings, he himself testified that he had uh, no doubt about St. Dominic's sanctity. He said, I am as sure of Dominic's sanctity as I am of the sanctity of St. Peter and St. Paul. Um, and to the story that I wanna share with you that uh, demonstrates the thoughtfulness that made him a good friend is a story that's related to the nuns of our order. So you might not know this. Well, you might know the Dominicans are, it's a wide umbrella, right? So we have brothers, we have priests, we have sisters like me, we have nuns who are cloistered, and we also have Dominican laity. Um, but what you might not know is that the nuns were founded first. So when the whole order was celebrating our 800th jubilee in 2016, the nuns, they celebrated with everybody else, but they were also very pleased to remind us that they had actually been around for 800 years in 2015. Um, so St. Dominic, he loved his daughters very much and was very attentive to them. And one story that's passed down, especially among the sisters and the nuns, is that at the, towards the end of his life, St. Dominic was finally able to return to Spain, to his homeland. So came from Italy up through France, down into Spain. And of course, he had a lot to do there, a lot of administrative things, setting up the order there. But one thing that he definitely wanted to do while he was there was to get a present for the nuns back in Rome, to get a present for each nun. And he was a, he was a wise man, and so he got the same present for every, every nun, uh, so there would be no comparison. He got each nun a wooden spoon, and so he carried these wooden spoons with him back through France on this long horseback journey back into Italy, dropped them off with the nuns, gave, gave them to each nun, and of course they were so touched that they had a father who had been thinking about them thousands of miles away and had brought these spoons back for them. Um, and we remember that to this day. And actually, I know of at least one convent of nuns in Summit, New Jersey. The young women who enter receive, when they enter, a wooden spoon in remembrance of this that they take with them through throughout their whole religious life. So Dominic was um, a man of, of friendship. Um, he was also a man of joy. And my favorite story about this is early in the order, there were some new friars and they were, so they were novices, they were young, they were just learning the life, they're praying night prayer, right? And uh, when you're learning something new um, and you're supposed to be doing something solemn, oftentimes that results in laughter. It's just what happens. Um, so something must have gone wrong or somebody Anyway, who knows what happened, but they're supposed to be praying night prayer and they start laughing and it's contagious and they can't stop. And there was this older friar there and he said to, to Dominic, he said, 
you need to correct these friars, you know, you need to make them stop laughing, recollect themselves, continue their prayers. This is very inappropriate. And St. Dominic looked at the older friar and he said, let them laugh. Why shouldn't they laugh? They have thrown off the thraldom of the devil. So they should, they should laugh. They should rejoice. Let them laugh. Um, and to this day, my understanding, we, we have a lot of customs that come from the monastic tradition of St. Benedict and those who followed him, including silence. So we live places and times of silence. But laughter doesn't break silence. So if something funny happens in silence, you're free to laugh. Um, and I do often. So it's very, it's very joyous. Um, but this also um, leads me to my third characteristics of St. Dominic, a man of conversion. Um, the reason he was so joyful was because he had a very clear sense of sin and also of Christ's victory over sin. And so that's what he, he saw. These young men, they had given themselves completely to God, um, thrown themselves at his mercy and given all of their talents and their treasure to him and would live a life of conversion. And that's a joyful life. Um, so St. Dominic was very aware of his own sin. He often wept and did penance for his own sins. Uh, he would do penance for the sins of others. He would often pray before he was going into a, a town to preach. He asked God, you know, don't let the people that I'm preaching to receive any less because of my sins. Um, don't let the, me be a less transparent window for the light of your grace because of my own sins. So he was very much a man of conversion uh, because he knew that when we turn away from sin, that's how we find true joy. And that's what he wanted to give people. And a final, one final story, the dispersal of the brethren. So this is a, a famous story that's handed on to us. Dominic had just come back from Rome. He'd just gotten approval for the order. He only had a few friars and he comes back. Everyone's happy to see him. And you know, maybe the next day he says, okay, I'm sending you all out two by two. You're gonna go to Paris. You're gonna go to Bologna. You're gonna go to Madrid. I'm sending you out. And the friars were kind of unsure. You know, they had not really lived this life very long. They weren't sure what it meant to be a Dominican friar yet. They weren't ready to go out on mission. And everyone who was advising Dominic, all the people who were supporting him financially, were just shocked. You know, this seemed very imprudent. What are you doing? How is there going to be, how is this idea going to continue if you're dispersing everybody? Um, so they really, they took him to task. And St. Dominic said, let me alone. I know what I am about. And then he said, seed when hoarded rots, but when scattered, bears fruit. Uh, so very bold, very sure of what he was doing. And that's, that's the story that's well known. But what isn't as well known is that in Rome, where he had just come back from, he had had a vision of St. Peter and St. Paul, and they gave him a book and a staff and then he saw his friars two by two circling the globe. And so all this was not the only bold, uh, humanly imprudent decision that Dominic made. Um, but every time he made a decision like that, it was based on prayer. It was based on some encounter that he had had with God that gave him the assurance that no matter how incredible this move seemed, it was what God wanted and God would bless it. And that's why people trusted St. Dominic because he had a deep prayer life. He was a man of true, very profound faith and his decisions were based on prayer and his friendship with God. I'd like to leave you with an image from a Dominican antiphonary. It's an illumination and it is, you'll see St. Dominic inviting people to the table of the Lord. So Christ is there. And it's very clear that Dominic is an instrument of Christ. He has one hand down pointing towards the table, one hand pointed upwards towards heaven. And you'll see a, a stream of people coming and they are um, beginning to take off their outer garments as a sign of their conversion. And they're coming to this, this table of the Lord. And an early, a very early Dominican within about 50 years of Dominic's death um, spoke of Dominicans as the servants from the parable where the master throws a wedding feast and he wants to invite everyone. 
And so he sends out his servants to invite everyone to the wedding feast. That's what Dominicans do. We are here to invite people to the wedding feast, to, to the joy of a relationship with Christ through our preaching and through our teaching. And that wedding feast is not just heaven. Of course, that's our ultimate our ultimate happiness will be the wedding feast of the Lamb in heaven, but also the joy of friendship, feasting with our Lord in this life uh, through a strong relationship with him.